All right, everybody, let's begin. My name is Akash Thakar. I did the sound design for Hyperlight Drifter. Hooray! Thank you all so much for coming. I really appreciate you taking time out to make it over here. I'm actually based in Seattle, so coming all the way to Australia and then seeing to this asshole's talk is really, really nice to see and makes me really, really happy. So before I begin, I'm just going to send around a little clipboard thing. I have a newsletter for those of you who are interested in freelancing in the game industry. That's where I share all my best stuff of just free advice. Here's how you actually make your thing a business. So I'm just going to pass this around. You don't have to sign up. Feel free to if you want to. And write legibly if you're line at AOL.com because that's a nightmare to parse and I have to do that all the time. So I'm just going to hand it out. If I see any squiggle line at AOL.com, I'm going to be pissed. <laughs> All right, so this talk is going to be really short and sweet. So we're going to have tons of time for questions at the end. So please hold on to any of your questions until we're completely done, all right? So before we get into it, I'm going to show you a trailer of Hyperlight Drifter just so everyone's on the same page in case any of you don't know what the game is. Cool. So that game is already out. And by the way, as the time of this recording, it's on sale. So heads up. So the point of sound design, I'm just coming at you with a really simple message today, just the crux of this whole talk. And the simple message is that the purpose of sound design is emotional impact. And that doesn't necessarily mean that you need to make your players cry every single time they match three in Bejeweled. That's not what emotional impact necessarily means. It could, but it could mean the simple act of making a gunshot on the other side of your map. Do players want to run towards it or do they want to run away from it? What do the footsteps tell you about the character? Are they slow? Are they fast? Are they smart? Are they cunning? Are they stealthy? Little bits of emotional impact can come from every single little bit of sound and music in all of your games. And that's the whole purpose of it, to elicit some small or big response every single time your player interacts or hears something. So that's the whole point. That's how I approached the sound for Hyperlight Drifter. Every single sound from the swords to the footsteps to the explosions to the monster growls had to have some sort of emotional response, however small or however big, from the player. So a little bit about me before we go on. I am a composer and sound designer for games, worked on Hyperlight Drifter. I did some music work for the most recent Destiny Rise of Iron. I also did a TEDx talk on the power of video game music. So if you want to Google that, hooray, that'd be great. Get me those views. So also on top of that, I'm also a professor at the Seattle Film Institute, where I teach people how to make music and sound for video games, which is really, really fun. And a large part of what I do is helping people break into the industry or up their game in the industry so they can have an actual career and not be the starving artist. So that's the general rundown of me. So what we're going to be covering today is pretty straightforward. We'll be covering the design, the actual sound design process that I use to make some of the cool sounds in this game. The process between myself and working with the rest of the Heart Machine team, how it worked with me working remotely especially. And for those of you who are more developer types and not necessarily audio professionals, how to work with us weirdos and how to make the most of working with audio professionals so you can have the most emotional impact from your game. So the Heart Machine team, the company that made Hyperlight Drifter, was kind of spread out a little bit. Most of it was based in Los Angeles. I was in Seattle, and it was around 10 people total. I say around because we in and out. It's usually how it goes with indie teams. So mostly based in Los Angeles, that's where the core team was. I worked from my home 
bed in my jammy jams, and just get to the keyboard and start. The audio team for this game consisted of only two people, myself on sound design and Disaster Piece, the composer of games like Fez or movies like It Follows on music. He and I have known each other for many, many years, and I'll talk about how we kind of work together. So let's go into the design. So how the sounds and all that sort of good stuff were actually designed for this game. So I don't know what I'm doing, so I just need to mention that here real quick. But sound design is all about experimentation. There wasn't one time for any game I've ever worked on where I sat back and said, yeah, I nailed it on the first try. No, it took a lot of experimentation and a lot of time. And that's true for absolutely any discipline in, game in, in the game industry. So many of the sounds that I made didn't make it into the game necessarily. I think in total I made about 550-ish sound effects and maybe only 300 made it into the game. That's just because features that some sounds got repurposed. That's pretty normal. And it doesn't necessarily mean that that time was wasted because it allowed me to make some stuff that we ended up repurposing or going in a different direction with or some sound inspired a new animation. It wasn't wasted time. It was actually very, very useful. And it was good that I was brought on very early on to the pro into the project so that I could spend that time working with it. This is totally normal. All of you know this. You've all worked on games before and you know that the thing you have at the start isn't necessarily the exact same thing that you have at the end. So that's totally okay, that's totally normal. And a big part of this design process was layering sounds. I'm gonna show you a visual of what this is in just a second. So for every single sound, for those of you who are sound designers, you know that you don't just put one sound in and call it good. You're playing multiple sounds at the exact same time so you get a really unique characteristic. So that's what I did for a lot of these sounds in Hyperlight Drifter. So what we have here is Logic Pro, the software that I use to make all the sounds for this game. And this, what I'm showing you, is actually all of the layers for just one sword sound effect. So there are 16 layers every time the player just uses their heavy sword sound effect. So 16 sounds play every single time they just go And that's what gives it its unique character. So what I'm going to do in this video is you're going to see me walk through each and every individual layer of this sound effect. And then from there, it's going to play all of them together so you can see how they all kind of combine. And that's all of them together at the very end. We also have some crazy cool delay happening in this room, so it's adding a cool echo effect to every single sound. So that's not from me, but that's kind of cool. I like it. So like I mentioned, there's a lot of experimentation that went on. And because I was brought in early, I worked on this game for three years straight, I was allowed to make a bunch of, frankly, garbage so that we could get great results in the end. And that's one piece of advice. I'd like to give to everybody who may be working with audio people or really any contractor or any outside help for their game, get them in as early as humanly possible so that they can kind of grow with the rest of your team. I like to refer to game development as nothing more than a whole bunch of people failing until something kind of happens at the end. It's a miracle that games get made in the, at all in the first place. For those of you who have released anything, you know that's just grueling and it can be quite an accomplishment just to release something, just to ship something. So allowing everybody else, every other discipline to fail with you and grow with you as part of your team is really important and allows you to have really good results in the end. So to make some of these sounds, to record some of these sounds, I use some really unconventional tech to get these sounds kind of in the game. So I used a 1950s wire recorder and I also turned a stethoscope into a microphone. Now that nobody's confused, let's move on. <laughs> so actually, I have a 1950s wire recorder right here. So this is a piece of equipment that came out before tape. It was long before tape. Tape did overtake this. That's why most of you don't have these in your home, I'm assuming. And that's why none of you have maybe heard of this thing. It records onto two spools of metal wire, super, super thin metal wire, as thin as fishing wire. And it snaps all the time. It just snaps in half and can cut your throat wide open. It's terrifying to use. If you plug it in and you wait for it, wait for 10 minutes, it gets, it gets this crazy hum and it gets crazy hot. So you just hear like, 
that's after 10 minutes of it being plugged in and it just gets crazy warm. So you don't want to leave it alone. When you plug it in, you're right next to it with a fire extinguisher going like, please not today. So this thing, when I got it, actually came with a whole bunch of spools of recordings from the 1950s. So I have spools of recordings from people talking about their experiences during World War II. I have two little girls learning about the piano and how to play the piano for the first time with one of their parents recording it. I have someone listening to the radio and commentating on the news as it was happening in the 50s. This thing came with some real historical treasures. So I'm going to show you a video of what this thing sounds like so you can see it in motion and hear what sorts of weird, awesome music stuff came on it. So it's the instant Bioshock Fallout machine. It's fantastic. Well worth the $200 I spent on eBay. I don't think the guy I bought it from knew what it was, so I super lucked out. So to show you how I use this in the game, there's a main character, main enemy named Hal, who you're going to see infinitely animating right there. So Hal is kind of the big bad of Hyperlight Drifter. He's constantly following you throughout the game. He's infinitely powerful. And even at the end, when you do fight him, it's a hell of a boss fight, even when you're super, super powered up. So this is a creature that needed to sound completely different from every other monster in the game. It didn't need to be a standard growl or a grunt or a scream or anything like that. We needed this thing to sound menacing and just different and nightmarish from everything else that's in the game. So fun fact, all, almost all of the monsters except the wolves in Hyperlight Drifter are this angelic voice you're hearing right here. Just me going to a microphone like just into that for like 30 minutes at a time and then not having a voice the next morning, which was great. Just telling my friends like, oh, no, sorry, I was just growling all night. It's fine. Um, but for this in particular, what I did was I took the wire recorder. This comes with a microphone so you can record directly onto that filament. And I squealed like a pig directly into it. So I turned it on, hit record, and just went like, and just make this horrible screeching sound. I'm not going to do it because then my voice will go away. But what I did was I took that sound, put it into Logic Pro, stretched it out, added some reverb, put some equalization on it, and it ended up being what I'm about to show you. And again, this is this wonderful, <laughs> glorious, deep, angelic voice turned into this. So that sound, that nightmare sound came from, again, this that you're all kind of lulling to sleep to because it's so beautiful, <laughs> is what the wire recorder can do. It adds a really cool level of distortion on everything that's recorded into it, as you heard with that fun music, whatever the hell it was. And what you can do with sound design on it is just so distorted in its really unique way. When we were first working on this game, the director, Alex Preston, was like, watch Evangelion. That was his first directive for all of us. It's like, watch some anime. I'm like, OK, yeah, this is the worst job ever. I'm going to just watch some anime for six days. Um, and I wanted that kind of nightmare screaming sort of sound that they have in that show. And this was the result. So next up is that stethoscope microphone that I told you about. So this monstrosity here is a $6 stethoscope off of Amazon, so super cheap, just the cheapest one I could find. And what I did was I cut off the little ear hole thingies and then took that tube, so it's just the stethoscope diaphragm thing directly into a straight tube. I, I took that and I looped that through a hose spigot, so for like a garden hose spigot, basically, allowing you to connect the garden hose to other things. So I took that tube, put it through the hose spigot, shoved a microphone on the other side of that hose spigot, and then just taped the fuck out of it so it all stayed in place. And the whole purpose of that hose spigot is just to hold it together. That's it. And then I took a cheap microphone put a cable to it, and then put it into my portable recording device so I could walk around with the stethoscope and record normal everyday things like blood or the conversations on other sides of windows. Just the sort of thing that you would record every day. And yes, I did both of those things. There's an ambience at the very end of the game when you're fighting that last boss, Hal, where you hear this low rumble. That's just my blood. Whatever. So there's a file in the Hyperlight Drifter Game Maker project called blood, SND underscore Blood Ambience. And I think Blood Ambience is the greatest band name <laughs> probably imaginable. So if any of you want to start a prog band, we got a name. We're good. So one example I want to show you is for ambiences. So uh, what I did was I recorded little machines. So what I did was I recorded things that hum. So any sort of fluorescent light, 
freezers, electric toothbrushes, anything like that with a tiny motor in it, I recorded just holding my stethoscope up to it. So what you're about to hear is the sound of a almost entirely unedited freezer. So I just opened up my freezer, put the stethoscope up against the wall when it started kind of humming, and I added a little bit of reverb to it. That's it, that's all you're about to hear. And it sounds kind of heavenly and a really cool ambience. So again, that's a freezer. So coming through this stethoscope sounds completely different. So I love recording things like a water faucet with the stethoscope on top. It sounds completely different. So when I'm walking around with headphones plugged into this portable recording device with a stethoscope, I seem like a crazy person, but it's so cool. So one pro tip for those of you who are sound designers, if you don't want to like phrase suspicion, I, what I did was I bought a $7 construction vest, like an orange and yellow construction vest, and I wear that when I go field recording. Nobody bothers me. There have been police who walk by and just kind of nod their head and just keep walking because they just assume I'm supposed to be there. I bought two traffic cones, I bought a $7 construction vest, and I'm just holding a boom microphone into a construction like site. Nobody looks at me. Nobody cares. So pro tip, best investment I've ever made. So like if someone opens my closet, they'll see a construction vest and two traffic cones like, oh, he's a serial killer. Okay. Okay. I always had my I always had my suspicions. So let's talk about that workflow between me and the team considering I was remote. So like I mentioned, almost nothing was right on the first try. It kept getting better though, and even though many revisions were made, good feedback really helped keep everything on track. Alex Preston is really good at giving feedback. He's an artist, so he gave really good feedback. And good feedback is emotional. Using emotional words is super helpful to people like us when we're making something so intangible. So he would say something like, make it sound desolate, make this sound lonely, I want this to hurt when it happens. Things like that are very good feedback. That makes me stay on the right track. But bad feedback, as an example, from a different game that I worked on long, long time ago, the client told me to make something sound and he did that spider thing with his hands. So he said, make it sound that's terrible. Under no circumstances are any of you allowed to do a little spider lip thing when you're telling someone to do something. Like if you, if you want someone to do a coffee run for you, like can you get me a, how's that helpful? How's that helpful for anybody? So it took me two and a half months to figure out that that meant aggressive. Mm -mm. Aggressive would be a great word to use in that circumstance. He chose not to use it. So always use emotional words. It gets things matched really, really quickly. So in terms of revisions, one video I want to show you is of the health sound effect that went through, I believe, 11 revisions in the end. Some sounds got to revision 40 by the very end, which was totally cool because then the final product was better than it could have been had we stuck with revision one. But the health sound effect was just really troubling. It took a really long time to do. And what this video is going to show you is the drifter using the health pack, but you're going to hear diff version 1, 3, 5, 9, and 11, and 11 is the one that we decided on. So you're going to hear this, you're going to see the same scene, but with a different health effect, so you can see how it kind of evolved over time. So we ended up on that last one because we didn't want it to sound kind of Zelda, pretty, super happy, and we needed it to sound like something happened, something important just happened, and also you're injecting something into your leg and you don't know what it is, so it shouldn't be like, hooray! So that's what we ended up on for like a sound. Like, so something's happening, it's not unpleasant, but it's not terribly pleasant, and it's bassy. So that's kind of how we ended up working on that. And that's the iteration process that a lot of sounds went through of, okay, it sounds good, go in this direction, let's try this, how about this? And then eventually it focuses and becomes the final sound. So the video I'm about to show you now is what the game sounded like two years into development. This is when the sound started to really gel. It took two years for the sound to finally come together. So two years in, but the game took three years to make. So the next video I'm about to show you is basically done. It's almost completely done. And this is me playing, and I'm terrible at this game. It's super hard. I've had a rough time beating this, even though I made this thing for three years. So anytime I had to play test it, I was like, like, can I have an easy mode, Alex? He's like, no, 
Absolutely not. Um, so I have to use God mode and all that. But <laughs> um, so in this video, you're going to see hear more variety of enemies. You're going to hear more bass, which is rad. You're going to hear some more, just a bigger mix of the sounds all together. Also, we have the cool sword thing, which is oh, so rad. When they put that in, I got so happy. So I made a sound for it like right away, even though they're higher priorities. Whatever. There's a sword thing. So we did this in Game Maker, was the engine that we ended up using. And while it's a fine 2D <laughs> engine, <laughs> um, for any of you who have worked in audio for Game Maker, it's mm -hmm. the worst. <laughs> It's a great 2D engine, but for audio, oh my god, it was just a nightmare. So all of the assets, every single one, all 300 of the sounds and disaster pieces, music, which was also interactive, was programmed in by hand. So we didn't have things like WISE or FMOD or any other middleware tools. We had a few custom tools that Teddy and Bo, our programmers, made for us, but that's all they had time to make. They had other things to do. They couldn't just make us the best audio tools in the world because they had a game to program. So the vast majority were just programmed in by hand, and then we had to say, fade from this track to this track when this happens. OK, that didn't work. Let's try another fade time. And the volumes were controlled by script. So let me talk about what that means. So when you open up iTunes or YouTube or something, you see a volume slider, right? And when you slide it to the left, it mutes the sound. And when you slide it all the way to the right, it makes it as loud as it could possibly go, right? That's what humans would do. That's how humans would make software. Game Maker's audio engine, I theorize, wasn't made by humans. So there's a whole bunch, when you open up any sound asset in Game Maker, it shows the sound, it shows like some compression properties, and it has a volume slider. So you're like, sweet, I'm just gonna slide this a little bit to the left to make it quieter. Compile, wait seven hours, <coughs> wait seven hours, okay, it finally compiles. You play the game and realize, it's not that quieter. I'm just gonna crank it up. Let's see if that changes anything. You wait seven hours, your beard is growing. <laughs> Regardless of your gender, your beard is growing. <laughs> and then you realize the faders aren't hooked up to anything. <laughs> They're there for show. <laughs> Some of you are nodding, because you know. <laughs> You've dealt with this nightmare. You grab that fader and move it around like crazy, it doesn't do anything. So that took me a while to figure out, because no one knew that. That's not common knowledge that, oh, the volume fader doesn't control volume. <laughs> Excuse me? Like, I remember when Alex told me that. He's like, oh, yeah, didn't you know? I'm like, no. <laughs> what? How do you know that? It was just a nightmare to figure out. And I looked at my cyanide pill longingly and said, is today the day? <laughs> so we had to go through every single sound, all 300 whatever, and script the volume out of 100 by hand. So what I would do is look at all of these sound effects, every single one in a script, and go like, this footstep is a 64 out of 100. Yeah. <laughs> Compile. <laughs> Compile. Look at cyanide pill. Then you play the game. You're like, no, nah, these footsteps are too loud. Quit out, because this ain't unity. Can't edit shit on the fly. No, no. That's a 63. <laughs> Compile. For every single sound in this game. So that was a huge time sink. So that was probably the biggest time sink, was actually mixing this game and making sure everything was in balance with one another. So the message I want to share with you is that this takes time, and it takes more time than you could ever think. It's so common to scope games, you know, too shortly, and we, it's not, it's impossible to scope a game perfectly. No, like, it's going to come out on this date three years from now, it's going to be perfect, exactly what I imagine. So whenever you're dealing with something like this, especially something so creative as game development, assume there's going to be roadblocks like this that you don't know about that are different from your discipline that are going to take a while to figure out. Because when you do that, you're not so stressed out with all these short deadlines when you run into these weird roadblocks that you never could have planned for. Always plan for something unexpected and kind of garbagey to come up. So in terms of me working from home, we did a pretty simple setup. So Slack was our best friend, of course. Slack is just the best thing ever. We use that every single day. 
Asana and Workflowy were good for managing our tasks. So Asana is just an online web app that allows you to assign tasks to other people, see what everyone's doing. You don't need to email anybody. People just check off their tasks as they go. Very well made. And then we eventually transitioned to Workflowy, which is just a series of very simple bullet point management lists. That's it, and you can share bullet point lists with other people. Very, very simple, and we liked that just because it was so straightforward, so easy to see, you can share lists with other people, it was great. Now I love Workflowy so much that I use it to manage my day-to-day -day life, so it's awesome, I recommend it to everybody. Lots of regular check-ins, so every single week, Alex and I would call each other, check in for at least five minutes and say, what are you up to, what's going on, even if nothing happened, that was really crucial because I was away, I wasn't in Los Angeles, so it's really easy to forget about the people who aren't physically there. So even if no updates were made on either end, we would still have a call, usually it was like Monday or Thursday, just to say, hey, how are you doing? Good, nothing new? Okay, talk to you soon, later, bye. Just to keep in touch, and that was really, really helpful. Now, a lot of people ask like, oh, how did you and Disaster Peace work together? Because I think we've known each other for about seven years, we barely talked throughout this whole project. So because we've known each other since school and kind of have always been on the same page in terms of our philosophies of sound and music, throughout the whole project, we talked maybe three times over the course of three years, and it was really quick conversations. One was, hey, can you avoid high frequencies here? Yeah, sure. Can you add high frequencies here? Okay. And the third one was, hey, I'm making some music for this bird boss. Do you want to add some sick bird chants to my music? Yes, disaster piece. Yes, I do. <laughs> so I made some sweet bird chants. I synthesized a bird going like, Rah! and we made like a bird chanting in the background for this boss fight. It was great. And that's the only times we talked to each other. Other than that, we were just kind of on the same page. That being said, if you do have composers and sound designers who may not know each other that well, get them to talk to one another so they don't step on each other's feet. We just happen to luck out that we've known each other and have had the same philosophy for a really long time. So for those of you who are audio people, my favorite plugins for this project were Logic's Bit Crusher, which is just a plugin built into Logic. A Bit Crusher is something that makes it sound like you're lopping off bits for the sound. It's a really cool distortion that sounds really digital and just messed up. So I use that a lot. Reverb, so I use lots of reverb, obviously, and reverb is like the fairy dust of the audio world. The more you put on, the better everything is. Your album's not good, reverb. The sound isn't good, reverb. Everything's fine. But I use, in particular, Audio Damage's EOS reverb, which has an infinite setting. So what I would do was take a sound, put it in, hit space to play it, hit infinite, leave for three hours. When I come back, I have this weird reverberated thing that's been reverberating on itself for three hours take a section, cut it out, say, I'm an artist, send it off to <laughs> Alex Preston. He's like, wow, that's a cool Amy. And so I'm like, I'm an, I know I'm an artist. I don't think you heard me when I said it to myself. So I loved using this reverb. I still use it for every single project. It's the coolest sounding reverb. It's only 50 bucks. Love that thing. I still use it every single day on everything. It's just so cool sounding. It has a really dark sound, so I recommend looking into it. It was a big part of what made how that sound sound like that. Really, really cool. And Native Instruments Absinthe is another one that I love. A lot of you probably know it, it's super popular. It's a synthesizer and effect that is meant to sound sci-fi-y and really weird and alien and otherworldly. So I built a bunch of synthesizer patches within it that sound of the Hyperlight Drifter world so I could use those almost as presets and then tweak depending on how I wanted it to sound. So those are really useful plugins. So we're almost done. Like I mentioned, this talk is short and sweet. So just some tips for those of you who may be working with audio people in the future. So for those of you who may not be audio people. So like I mentioned, hire early, let people fail with you, grow with the rest of the team. Establishing common terms is really crucially important. So how I do this with my clients, and you can do it in a different way, is to get a style guide, which is just concept sound or concept music, similar to concept art. So when you start a project, I just send them either a whole bunch of sound that here's what I think the game should sound like, or if they have any gameplay capture, I put sound to it, or if they have nothing at all, no gameplay, no concept art, nothing, I make a soundscape. So like one to two minutes where if they close their eyes, they can pretend they're playing the game through sound. So footsteps are there, they go through a different room, the ambience changes, combat happens here. They can just listen and know that they're kind of playing the game as it were. And that gives me a good idea of, am I going in the right direction? Do they hate certain sounds? And what I ask for really specifically is what do you like and what do you hate? Tell me every single step that you like and hate. And then from there, I kind of write down what they said 
and kind of parse it into my own language in my brain. So if they say, I really like this sparkly bit here, I'll be like, okay, the sparkly bit was that weird guitar patch that I used. Use more of that. Or they like, I don't like this warble bass thing that you have going on here. Okay, warble bass means this. So going through that makes things a lot easier when you're talking with clients and makes things so much simpler when someone says, I want that sound that you had earlier. You're like, oh, okay, I know exactly what you're talking about. Let me go reach, reach for it. Saved a lot of time. And lastly, of course, expect iteration. Almost nothing's gonna be right on the first try. There will be some sounds that you make, of course, that are dead on, straight, first try. I think actually, Throughout this whole game, I did one sound right on the first try, which is the rail gun. It's just and Alex was like, I want to marry this sound. I was like, yes. And never again. Every single time afterwards, he's like, do it again. I'm like, oh, damn it, damn it. It's not the rail gun. It'll never be the rail gun again. So that's what I recommend. Just expect things to need revision in time, just like every other discipline for game development. So that's it. Thank you so much. Please sign up for that newsletter if it's been making its way around. Here's all of my contact information right here. So very active on Twitter, send selfies all the time. Some of you know, you've probably seen them already. There's my email address, very responsive on there, and there's my website. So thank you all so much for coming. I have business cards up here too if you want an actual physical thing to take home. So thanks so much, and now we will do questions. Yeah, thanks. Mm -hmm. um, what's your what's your go to when you go? All right, this needs more of crunch, more mm -hmm. of bass, more of whatever. Do you reach for a library that you have or libraries that you purchased, or do you grab your your recorder and get out? Uh, good question. So if I'm looking for a sound that has a specific parameter, what do I reach for? Is it a library? Do I record it? Whatever it may be. So what I like to do, let's say it's crunch, for example. Um, what I prefer to do in almost all circumstances is see one if I've already recorded it already. So I have a nice database that I've all metadata and tagged and all that. But if I don't have it, I will more often than not go record it versus purchasing a library. There's some sounds that you're like, I can't do this at home. Like I can't make an explosion that's a giant explosion without blowing something up. Okay, fine, I'll just get my rocket launcher. Like you can't do that. So yes, for very difficult sounds, I'll reach for a library, but more often than not, I'll make a huge effort to record my own stuff. So like I would I would like text a friend, but can I borrow your wheelbarrow? It's like, what? I'm like, I'm coming to get your wheelbarrow. <laughs> um, and then I'm like that I text another friend who's like in the construction industry. I'm like, I need concrete. He's like, what? I'm like, I'm coming to get your concrete, <laughs> fill one with the other, and then record crunchy sounds, for example. So I go way out of my way to do it because it makes more of a unique effect. But when I can't, libraries are fine. <laughs> Does that answer your question? Cool. Awesome. Anyone else? Yes. So, so when I have like 40 different revisions and ah, good question. Yeah. So, so for my, my, um, way that I bill and all that sort of stuff, I do actually unlimited revisions for the clients that I know won't abuse it. So I always kind of like interview my clients before doing a game to make sure like, okay, do you seem like the sort of person who will just be dissatisfied no matter what? I'm going to bill you for revisions. Or if you're cool and are making something that you know requires time and they're giving me the time to do it, then I'll just do a flat fee and say, this is unlimited revisions, it's cool, let's make the best thing we possibly can. It really changes depending on the game, the client, the timeline is a big part of that. Having three years, great. I have tons of time, unlimited revisions, no problem. I have a week, I'm not gonna give you unlimited revisions in that short time frame. So that, that's kind of how I do it. It's really malleable, but that's the kind of basic seed that I go from. Anything else? Yes. You were talking about the status approach you picked up earlier. What's another, um, I guess, easy to access recording equipment, hardware and stuff that I can pick up? Yeah, so easy to get recording equipment. Anything like typing in a field recorder into Amazon, great way to start. Those are just portable recorders. They range from anything from 50 bucks all the way to in the thousands, so you can kind of pick your range there. Then what some field recorders offer is, like you saw, a microphone input on the bottom, and you can just buy some cheap, cheap microphones that you can plug into there and work that way. There's another, there's, oh my god, I'm about to like froth at the mouth and just go for hours, so I'm gonna 
hold myself back if you want to send me an email. Like, here's an entire list on Amazon. The card is $6,000, just hit buy it now. <laughs> um, but if you want, you can buy really cheap microphones from things like Radio Shack and all that sort of stuff too, if you just want really basic sound setups. It depends on the quality you're looking for, of course, too. If you want really pristine nature sounds without any wind or anything, you just want that bird in that tree, you're gonna have to buy some nicer equipment. If you want some simple footsteps, buying a simple microphone, like a Shure SM57 is the standard super cheap one, some cheap microphone, hooking it into a field recorder and recording yourself some footsteps, that's a great way to go. If you don't want to record anything in general, you can also get sound effect libraries. So just pre-packaged sounds that you can get. You can get like animals, footsteps, foley, doors, rifles, everything's out there. You can just buy those, which will save you a lot of time. And what you can do to those is futz with it in software and make it sound like your own instead of just dragging and dropping and calling it good. So those are some ways to kind of go around it. Anything else? Yes. Oh my God, <laughs> creative block all the time, every day. Uh, the way I overcome it, per okay, this is weird. Um, obviously you do the walk thing, like everyone does the whole like, okay, just take a walk, step away. So stepping away is a big thing. My personal favorite though is taking a ice bath. <laughs> so I go to the convenience store, I'm not joking, this actually happens. Uh, buy one of those giant bags of ice, fill up my tub with cold water, dump it, and say, okay. And then I go in said tub and shiver for a while. I take cold showers anyway, I'm a weirdo. I don't like hot showers, but anyway. Um, so that's actually one way I get around it and it actually helps me immensely. I don't know why, it's probably because my body thinks, oh, you're dying. <laughs> um, so it, it works really well though to get myself out of my own head because my brain just turns off and just starts shivering. It's just like cold, cold, cold. That's the only thought that goes in my brain. It's like forced meditation in a way. I'm not saying all of you need to do ice baths, but you asked, you opened this can of worms, you opened this Pandora's box, so it's your fault. Um, but anything that distances me as much as I possibly can from the project, I do meditation as well, like all that sort of stuff. Anything that gets me out of my own head gets me through it. There are those times, however, where I just need to say, I'm gonna make a whole bunch of variations on this and not send them to Alex, because I know I need to just burst through this with work and time. So there are some revisions that he's never heard because I just knew they weren't good. I just had to make trash for me so I could wind up with something good and be like, ha ha, here you go. This only took me one attempt. And he's like, this is good, do it again. I'm like, damn it. But those are a few of the ways I get around it. They're kind of weird, especially the ice bath one, but you asked, so really the blame is on you. <laughs> Anything else? Uh, yes? Um, what inspired you to do sound for the game industry, and also what did you do before you actually joined this kind of industry? Oh, good question. So what inspired me to do sound for the industry, and what did I do before? So I went to Berklee College of Music in Boston, Massachusetts, on the east coast of the States, and I went there to be a rock star. So if you Facebook stalk me, I had hair down to my butt. I played drums in a prog band, so we can start Blood Ambience right now. I can play 7, 8 and all that shit, no problem. Um, then while I was there, I actually played with a group called uh, Video Games Live, if you know that group, so, and uh, Distant Worlds, the Nobuo Omatsu's orchestra and all that. So I was the drummer for those groups. And while I was there, I remember playing a concert with Nobuo himself, the composer of Final Fantasy, on stage. He was right next to me. And I remember coming out, or him coming out for One Winged Angel, and the crowd just started screaming for his name and all that. I was like, I want to be him. <laughs> I want to play his music. He's a cool guy. He's a really nice guy. I want to be that guy. Um, so from that point, I quit those groups and then started teaching myself at the school, like, okay, how do I do music? How do I do sound design for games specifically? And through that, eventually Berkeley took notice and started making like some video game classes and teaching all that sort of good stuff. Every Saturday, I would teach video game music and sound tutorials as like a volunteer class just for funsies. And it eventually got so big to the point where it was totally full and there was like waiting room and all that sort of stuff. So that's I think why Berkeley took notice. And basically I was one chapter ahead in books and YouTube tutorials in the rest of the class, but they didn't know that, it was fine. Um, so it was really self-taught with a mixture of some support of YouTube tutorials, all that sort of stuff. A little bit of Berkeley being like, 
here's what F mod and Y's are and all that. And a large part of it was I hated touring. I hated it. It's a nightmare. Just, I'm an introvert, so I just wanted to stay in my cave and be like, Nyeh, and just play with a keyboard and never leave and look outside and be like, stupid humans, <laughs> and like keep playing. And that allowed me to do that. Working in the game industry is super great for introverts. It's fantastic. I can just stay at home. And also, um, bugging a drum set around the world, <laughs> don't recommend it to any of you. So that is kind of, it was kind of like mixing my passion for games, I always loved games, with my love of introversion. Hey, this is perfect. So that's kind of, it kind of came about weirdly, but it snowballed very, very quickly. No, I was a strict drummer before going to that college, so I, I played, I could perform, but I couldn't really do music tech stuff. I didn't know anything about logic or anything like that. Totally self-taught in that regard. Anything else? Yeah. Do you have any tips for someone trying to learn sound design? Oh God, yes, so many. Um, so for those of you who want to learn sound design, the first key is to just start recording stuff and experimenting. Because you won't know that a tiger Growl sounds really good with a sword coming out of a sheath until you try it. I'm serious. I'm dead serious. That sounds awesome. It's the coolest freaking combination ever. You're like, Wah. it's oh, mm, um, <laughs> so good. But that's actually true because when you see things like the Star Wars documentaries on how they made sound and all that sort of stuff, Ben Burt, the sound designer, is like, I was walking by the sink and it sounded weird, so then I turned it into the Millennium Falcon. <laughs> like that's actually what happened. There's a lot of experimentation in this and the more you experiment, the more you can tell what sounds will work with what. And so if you can start either A, buying a field recorder or even using your laptop mic, like it really doesn't matter at first, and recording stuff and combining different materials, you'll start to gain that ear, which is really, really important. Because now I can sit at my laptop and say, this needs to sound crunchy. I know exactly what I need to do. And I go to my bag of Cheerios and I'm like, yeah. Because I want that Cheerio crunch. I want that whole grain crunch. I don't want that mini wheats crunch. I don't want that. That's not crunchy enough. Co cookie crisp is also really good. It's a good choice for that too. Um, but that's actually true. You get that ear as you do it. So I recommend experimenting. The second thing I recommend you do if you are in the game industry, like you want to do it specifically for games, is learning how games are made in general. If you you probably already know, but in case. Um, learning uh, about every single discipline, how things are implemented into the game, learning things like FMOD and WISE, which are audio implementation softwares. So FMOD is one, WWISE is the other. We can talk more about that over email because I can just shout at you for hours and hours and hours. Shameless plug, I have a YouTube channel with 70 videos on how to do sound design for games. Google my name and I, you'll see 70 videos plus of sound design tutorials, so go there as well. Um, yeah, please email me because I can just go for three hours and just be like, here, just here, here's a bunch of resources. But getting that ear, experimenting, learning how they work in games, that's a good way to get started. Anything else? How much time do we have? Oh, we have plenty of time. Okay. Yeah, Rami. <laughs> uh, what's a question you wish people would ask you that they never do? Oh, thank you. <laughs> What is the mo what is the weirdest, most darkest sound that you've ever recorded? Is that what you're asking now? Sure. I took a cello bow, I played cello, and I looked at my toilet one day and said, you need to make a sound now, toilet. I think I'm taking this question back. <laughs> Too late. Too late. So, you know, okay. <laughs> so my toilet's weird in my apartment. I need to describe it to you. Let's set the stage, everybody. So this toilet is, in, I don't know why, for some reason, in my apartment, this is a home. I don't live in a warehouse, like, like eating fish heads, like some of you may think. This is an industrial toilet. It's like one of those commercial toilets with like the handle on the side and it doesn't have the tank. It just like go, it's just a metal pipe that goes straight into the wall. Refills right away. It's awesome, never gets clogged. But this toilet, so because it has that big metal part, I took my cello bow and I was like, I wonder if this would make a sound if I took my cello bow and bowed it, like put a ton of rosin on it so it's super sticky and bowed it across to see what it, what it did. And that toilet made the biggest, bassiest, beefy sound in the world. It was just 
as I bowed this cello bow across it. So there I was like leaning over, hoping no one was looking, just like constantly looking over my shoulder like a person who lives in a warehouse eating fish heads all the day, going like, shit, I hope no one sees me. Then I whip out my stethoscope and I'm just like, yeah. Um, so that, <laughs> you asked for this. <laughs> So that is, so one question I wish people asked me was like, what's the most embarrassing sound you've ever recorded? And that'd be that. Another time, actually, I might as well keep going because you opened Pandora's box, is I need to make sounds for an educational game. And they're like, we need a sound for this rabbit pooping. I'll let you fill in your imaginations. Next question. <laughs> yes. Oh, do I have a greater, it switches between me liking sound effects more or music more. Um, when I was in hyperlight mode, sound effects. When I was in destiny mode, music. Flip flops all the time. Right now, I don't know. <laughs> I have no idea. I'm pretty much neutral on both. Um, actually, right now, I think my biggest passion is teaching people and ha helping them like kind of figure this stuff out and breaking into the game industry and all that sort of good stuff. But it'll change. In like three months, I'll be like, all right, it's music time, and I'll just ignore sound, sound design for a little while. Depends. I go through my moods, as we all do. So yeah. Anything else? Yeah. Do you uh, ever have clients get really attached to play solo music? Do I ever have clients who get attached to placeholder sound and music? Oh my god. Every time. Not every time. Sometimes. A good chunk of the time. The way I get around it is actually, if I have access to the project, which almost always I do, I just remove it for a few weeks and then start putting my own stuff in. Because if they're not hearing it constantly, they forget what it sounds like. And then I leave it, then I go back. Because let's say they like a certain track or a certain uh, sound. It doesn't mean I can't make a sound like that. But no matter what, even if I make a perfect replica, it's like, it's not Metal Gear, man. Why doesn't this sound like Metal Gear? It's like, it does sound like Metal Gear, stop! <laughs> so what I do is I go into the project and say, and I let them know, I don't just delete it and be like, haha, like, it must be a bug. No, I let them know. Um, I tell them like, okay, I'm going to remove this for a while because it's giving us some trouble. I make it so it's not about them, it's about us. That's really crucial. Um, and then say like, I'm just going to remove this for a while and I'm going to make a sound later and put it in and implement it later and then we'll see how we feel because it's really easy to get it attached to these sorts of sounds or music or whatever it may be. Then I put it in and then their feedback changes completely after a couple weeks, like maybe two weeks or however long I can possibly wait to leave that sound on the back burner or music on the back burner. Wait, put it in and sometimes like, oh, that's perfect. Oh, why didn't you do this the first time? Like, what's the first time? <laughs> God damn it. But that's a good way to get them unattached from whatever it is they were hearing. Any other questions? All right, I'll be hanging around today and tomorrow as well. So if you guys want to just chat in a big circle and hang out and talk about toilets, totally can. <laughs> All right, thank you so much.